Welcome to another webinar from Smart Manufacturing Magazine and AMT, the Association for Manufacturing Technology. Women in Automation and Robotics, two successful paths in aerospace and defense. I'm your host, Brett Brune. Today, we'll hear from two women who are profiled in 20 women making their mark in robotics and automation. That feature story was published in the February issue of Smart Manufacturing in text and audio formats. You can find the magazine at www.sme.org slash smart. Joining us now are Nicole Williams, Thermoplastic Composite Materials and Process Manager at the Boeing Company. She's in St. Louis. Welcome, welcome to the show, Nicole. Yes, thank you. All right. Um, are you going to introduce Marie yes. before I share? Just, okay. <laughs> just one, one second, sure. And also is Marie Christine Caron. She is Senior Engineering Section Manager at GV Aviations, sorry, GE Aviations. Global Robotics and Automation R&D Center, which is in Quebec, Canada. Welcome, Marie-Christine. Bonjour tout le monde. Hello, everyone. Thank you for having me. Fantastic. So yes, uh, Nicole, please take it away. All right, thank you so much. Okay, bear with me one moment here. Uh, while Nicole's getting ready, I should mention that we will, will be doing Q&A at the end of the session. So you can add your questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen as we go. Okay, can you see my slides all right now? Yes. Fantastic. So again, my name is Nicole Williams. I work as a first line manager within Boeing Research and Technology. As a manager of the Thermoplastic Composite Materials and Process Team in St. Louis specifically focusing on the use of thermoplastic composite materials to build aircraft parts. We have a number of automated processes for forming and shaping parts, and even a small robot to weld plies of material together. I've been with the Boeing company now for 22 years. Today, I'll share a little bit about my journey into engineering, robotics, and automation, and then I'll share a little bit about my work at Boeing. All right. My slide to progress here. Okay, so first of all, all photos in this presentation were taken prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, so you will not see anyone wearing masks. Since I was very young, I've been interested in taking things apart, computers, programming, and problem solving. I liked math. Math is consistent, it is dependable, I can trust it. Math is not arbitrary or whimsical or changing. I got my first computer, a Commodore VIC-20, when I was seven years old. My father and my uncle were electrical engineers. There's my father. Well, I guess you can't see my, can you see my cursor? Yes. My mm -hmm. father and then my uncle and aunt are over here. So my father uh, and uncle were electrical engineers and my aunt was a mechanical engineer. I grew up watching them fix things and take them apart and make them better. My father always encouraged my inquisitive mind. I remember uh, my parents used to get me these coding magazines with little snips of basic and I would program them and try it, try it out. Uh, my father also brought home really interesting things like punch cards and prototypes of things he was working on. He was a development uh, engineer at Hallmark for the musical cards and animated ornaments. So I got to see and touch and hold musical cards before anyone else. <laughs> and in particular, I remember one particular uh, mechanical ornament that he had made that had a small train uh, driving through a snow covered scene that went through a little tunnel. That was really neat and very interesting. Uh, my aunt Pam inspired me to go into mechanical engineering. I enjoyed discussing her work with her. She was a, a non-destructive engineer supporting the AWACS program. She showed me that mechanical engineers could work on anything from designing commercial products to medical implants, to robotics, uh, to supporting nuclear facilities. I really liked the, the variety of different types of projects that I could support. Um, I was constantly, I love constantly learning new things, using my skills to solve different types of problems, both inside and outside of work. Uh, my engineering family had a huge impact on shaping my view of the world. I really became interested specifically in robotics about 25 years ago um, in college at the University of Missouri Rolla, now known as Missouri s &T. The first robot I really worked with was an adept uh, SCORA configuration robot <clears throat> using V+. My lab partner and I 
created a fun project uh, doing shape sorting of different wooden blocks. We created our own algorithm uh, to segregate the rectangular blocks from the circular blocks, place one on a conveyor belt and the other one in a pile near the robot. My V plus programming skills are what got me hired into the Boeing company. Also in college, our senior design project was a wheelchair lift mechanism for focal podiatrist to get a patient <clears throat> to the correct level so that the doctor could work on their feet. Our design was basically just a wooden platform with a small lift mechanism, but I remember brainstorming with my colleagues, building various prototypes, troubleshooting mechanical issues. This project was a lot of fun. Later, I had a co-op at a nuclear power plant, <clears throat> excuse me, as a maintenance engineer, looking at various equipment in the plant and helping to lay out preventative maintenance schedules. Preventative maintenance is important anywhere, but especially in a nuclear power plant. You do not really want your equipment breaking down ever. <laughs> So uh, fortunately, many of the pieces of equipment and machines follow patterns. So we would study them, uh, learn predictively when, when they would have problems and then go out and address the problem before they happened. I love studying and recognizing patterns and applying the patterns to solve the problems again before they happened. This was an excellent opportunity to do just that. I then had an internship at an HVAC company where I focused on drafting, mechanical design, analysis, programming. One interesting programming challenge there was figuring out how to create a three-dimensional chart uh, for displaying data. We were also building modul modular engineering systems for, to design the HVAC units, where you can lay out the different sections of the unit based on different requirements. I learned uh, that little things like the types of fasteners that you specify can have a huge impact on your overall project costs. I learned what uh, NEMA 4 explosion proofing meant and how we tested the units for compliance. Later, I ended up meeting my future boss, Lee Chrysler, at a university career fair. He told me about all the great opportunities at the Boeing Company. I applied, interviewed, and was really excited when I received my offer letter in the mail. This was the start of my engineering career. Now, you're still on your, you're still on your first slide, is that correct? Uh, yes. Okay. I'm going to uh, actually, yeah, I'm going to switch here shortly, but not okay. quite yet. Thank you. No problem. No problem. Yep. Sometimes it's easy to get get so focused on <laughs> the presentation Speaking, that yes. I forget to forget all about the slides. So thank yeah. you. All right. So I started at Boeing in January of 1999, and on Martin Luther King Day, in fact, I supported an AFP development robot working a variety of parts. Uh, this was a gantry style robot with a large end effector <clears throat> or head, which contained a creel that held the spools of carbon fiber epoxy material. The machine was using V plus programming. During this time, I got to know Dan Block, who was a longtime mentor and taught me much of what I know about mechanical design, robotics, and technology integration. Many of my early assignments included uh, creating drawings for his designs. I learned about the patent application process and how difficult it can be and how long the process can take. I also incorporated a, a cryogenic cooling system onto our AFP machine to keep the thermostat material from sticking inside the head. I soon became involved in programming in a product called iGrip, creating robot programming tools and simulation tools for robot programs. I worked closely with many different NC programmers. My technical lead at the time was Kevin Sitton. He was the brains behind an application called RAC, Robot Assembly Cell Control. He taught me a lot about project management, so how you lay out tasks, create a work breakdown structure, build up good time estimates for tasks, plan the work and allocate the resources. This was before scrum meetings, storyboarding, use cases, et cetera. In fact, it was really before we had much concern about the human machine interface at all, uh, or how, how users were really interacting with the software. So to make a universal programming and machine control independent of the hardware would present a common interface to the machine operator, allowing for the operator to easily run multiple types of machines, uh, performing similar, sim similar operations <laughs> on different aircraft components. So here's the screen, the basic screen that the operator sees. So you can tell uh, we're processing through different points and uh, we color code things for whether they're completed or not completed and provide a little bit of feedback data uh, down at the bottom so that they can get a feel for, for what's happening. So RAC was a brilliant uh, Boeing de developed robotic agnostic control system. Our goal was to make the programming and simulation portion agnostic for the NC programmers so that when they went from one work cell to another, or one airplane part to another, it would not matter for the basic programming process or the data assimilation. 
It also made the life e made life easier for the machine operator. Like I said, the machine operators could move from one machine to another, one work cell to another, and the screen would, would look very similar. So in order to make uh, automation as flexible as possible in an aerospace environment, we rely heavily on this goal-based control. So rather than writing an explicit script of actions for the robot to complete or execute, like in traditional robot programming, we give it a set of goals and rules on how to complete these goals. So for example, say there are certain points that you can't process, um, you can skip over those and go, go to later points or later goals in the path um, easily. So goal-based autonomy has enabled Boeing to improve our overall equipment effectiveness, first time quality, and usability for both maintenance and mechanics. It became my role to assemble all the models into the robotic simulation. At the time, again, using a tool called iGrip, which was programmed using graphical simulation language and command line interpreter. These languages were similar to Pascal. We also used a number of shared library functions written in C and C++. Kevin also taught me much of what I know about object-oriented programming, and then later in C-sharp in the .NET framework. Overall, I do find it very interesting how much computer programming I've done as an engineer. Of course, each individual program and robotic system had to be simulated to identify potential issues prior to production. For example, we had one system designed for drilling C-17 pylons. At the time, I was the only one with the software and capability to bring all the pieces together into the work cell, including the tar uh, tooling, the part, the robot, the ineffector, identified portions of the tooling that were blocking areas that the robot needed to access to drill out locations. In the end, we ended up having to cut away part of the tooling to allow access for the robot end effector. This was an important lesson learned for our whole team. In future projects, we were very careful to bring all the stakeholders together earlier in the process and simulate multiple conditions and scenarios prior to construction. Okay, so this is what uh, our robot cells look like today. This shows a later version uh, or more modern version of robots we've uh, purchased from Electro Impact. Our original robots were stationary or had four mounted linear tracks. Whereas you can see on these, they have vertical tracks uh, to increase the height reach for each robotic system. Most recent, again, updates involve either vertical tracks or as you will see in a later slide, uh, tracks on an angle. And then also some robot manufacturers now have nonlinear tracks uh, for specialized applications. So, oh, come back. Sorry. So the robot cell shown here, we call it the quad bot. Obviously, there's four robots there. <laughs> so <laughs> these robots are drilling and installing uh, fasteners for section 48 of the 787. Well, look how the small the people are in that photo. Right. These are very large robots. I'm used to working with very large industrial robots. Um, the accuracy, the payload, the quality and capability represent the state of the art in robotic uh, technology and aerospace. I was also heavily involved in writing computer vision algorithms for these robots. So the main features of this cell include localization using machine vision, which I'll get into a little bit more here soon, uh, goal-based goal -based supervisory control. So that's that rack control system, robot accuracy through kinematic calibration. So we have specific kinematic calibration that we, that we use for our robots. And then a complete use of OLP without any touch up. So it's something that I think that's pretty rare to be able to take a program right off the NC programmer's computer and go run it out in the shop without having to, to do a lot of dry running or adjustment. So again, frequently uh, simulations I created were used in meetings uh, early on with the machine tool suppliers and get, helping all the stakeholders really to visualize our concerns this often affected the machine design and modifications. So soon I started to travel more to be able to train NC programmers how to use the tools we had developed and to use the simulations in a production aircraft environment. All right, so travel and experiences. So hopefully you can see my slides. I've, I've had a lot of uh, fortunate opportunities to, to travel the world and uh, one unique experience that I show here so I got to go to Australia twice, which is fascinating. I, I love Australia. It's beautiful down there. My engineering career helped me to go yeah, again, see the world. Luckily, my husband was also able to go with me to Australia. So we had a little vacation along with a lot of hard work. I had uh, travel experiences both through work opportunities and by providing income to go on a cruise to Alaska and a river cruise through Germany. My unique experience shown here is I had opportunity to lead a one project. One stands for opportunities for new experiences 
at Boeing, uh, which was on, um, autonomous driving cars. So we received a used uh, Jeep from our security team. We retrofitted it with a Validon LiDAR and some other sensors. My greatest learning from this experience was how to process and filter massive amounts of data. So we were getting four gigabits of data per second and <laughs> processing that and figuring out how to make uh, meaningful maps and set waypoints. And it was very interesting. We were to bring out some high school teams to interact with the vehicle and watch it drive around the parking lot. It was a really fulfilling experience. But it was an extracurricular ex experience. So Boeing is really good about providing opportunities, again, both inside the regular work schedule and, and outside to learn new skills. I also had opportunities to work on production implementations for F-18, uh, C-17, and 787. Around this time, I learned a hard way that not every airplane program follows the same coordinate system conventions. Uh, we were used to military aircraft that had the extraction along the, the fuselage or station line. And then we were now working on a commercial variant that had the Y direction down the station line. This did cause some issues early on in our preliminary acceptance testing, but they were discovered and rectified quickly. And then my team ended up winning a Silver Phantom Award for that project. So that, that was an exciting recognition. Part of our control scheme in RAC uh, did involve scanning the part using uh, tooling and part features to derive a more accurate final position. In aircraft building, edge distance is an important datum. So if you drill a hole too close to the edge of a rib or spar, you risk premature failure of that part. My graduate research involved using this image data to train a series of neural networks, comparing the results against our traditional regression-based location derivation. I really enjoyed vision system programming and figuring out ways to get the automated system to think more like a human. For example, working vision system problems such as trying to image shiny objects like metallic tools. I found ways to look at the lighting conditions both before and after applying our artificial lights and then subtract out the ambient light. Uh, this made the system more robust for mobile platforms. So it could be moved around to different uh, areas that had different ambient lighting conditions. I also set up scripts to try scanning the objects in an iterative fashion multiple times with different exposures and lighting conditions sometimes direct backlight or different angles of incidences, we would have uh, an array of lights that we could, could leverage. Then I would look at the, the, loud, uh, sorry, the validity of the results. So we knew, typically knew what shapes we were looking for. So I could take uh, edge information from the blob detection and then look at the RMS values versus the expected shape. And I could basically differentiate which set of values was the best. And then we would use that data for, for positional determination. All right, so let's see, next slide. I can get this to cooperate. There we go. So uh, my vision system work, um, I really found one opportunity to leverage that information and help students learn and grow through FIRST. I first um, got into robotics with the FIRST program about 12 years ago. They've come a long way in reducing uh, these types of programs have come a long way against re reducing the stigma against robotics. I think it reduces the fear of losing one's job or, or being classified a nerd, especially in high school. Uh, Boeing formed a team of engineers back in 2008, 2009 uh, that were interested, got us a first robotics kit. Again, this was an extracurricular activity, taught us how to be mentors. And then we had a mission to go out and start up new first robotics teams. And I've, I've loved it and I've been doing it ever since. So I love being a core values judge for FLL, the first Lego league, uh, it's typically middle school age, uh, and then a mentor for FRC, the high school teams. I've also enjoyed many years of mentoring FTC, FTC first technical challenge teams, which is a smaller robot and it's typically like eighth to 12th grade. So some schools prefer the FTC because it, it there's less uh, budget requirement for them and, and still gives a good student, students a good way to go through that design process and learn about robotics and, and be involved. So in this picture here, you can see I was the FTAA, so the field technical advisor at the St. Louis Regional event a couple of years ago. Now, if you don't have an opportunity to join a first team, there are a lot of other opportunities out there like BEST or VEX or Sea Perch or MATE. One of my colleagues has been, been involved in MATE uh, for underwater robotics for, for many years. 
There's so many ways to get involved, uh, even support drones and underwater robotics to help with natural disasters. You probably heard about the Thumb Long uh, Cave Rescue with the soccer team that was trapped. They did use robotic platforms to assist with that rescue. I was also an adjunct lecturer at Fontbonne University. Uh, there I asked students to complete a project in which they would assemble and program a five axis manipulator. Uh, we used the little OWI kits, which were inexpensive. Each student had their own kit, and then they would think of creative ways that their robots could work together. Uh, one of my favorite outcomes for this project was uh, one team build robots that would fold shirts for like a laundry scenario. So that was, it was pretty interesting to see what concepts and ideas that they came up with. Also, uh, another student had a concept for their robots to be tending plants on the moon. So I'm sure that, you know, robotics are gonna become more and more incorporated into our daily lives. I'm sure many of us already have robotic vacuums. All right, so this next slide shows um, a number of the, the automated processes that we have in thermoplastic composites here at the Boeing Company. Some applications like the automated material conversion, just the one in the upper right here, use a small con uh, SCARA configuration robot. They are quick and uh, very repeatable. Uh, we have to create our own uh, 90 and 45 deg degree rolls of material for use in isometric layups because uh, all of our material comes in zero direction flies. And then other op applications here show uh, like pick and place and the uh, by replacements I mentioned earlier. Thermoplastic welding all use articulated arm type configuration robots. Uh, they, many of them have a six axis, which allows for specific end, end effector orientation. All right. So some of the challenges that we face in composite fabrication automation incl include um, or are shown here, sorry. There's one another large articulated arm. You can see again against the human, they're, they're very large robots. Uh, thermoplastics offer great alternatives for recyclability, adaptability to additive manufacturing, which we're studying more now. We have new opportunities for robotic and automation applications. Some of the key challenges again are shown here. Um, let's see. Okay, we're ready to go to the next slide. All right, this slide shows our new approach for using data analytics in the manufacturing process. I included it mostly to point out what types of skills we need. So we need skills in simulation, sensors, data collection, analysis, computer programming, and integration. So again, it shows the, the variety of tasks that an engineer can perform and still be involved heavily in robotics. There are always many new problems to solve and many diverse types of experiences to embrace. Again, I love the variety of the work that I do. Uh, this slide shows a number of, there's the, the rail on an angle that I mentioned earlier. Many different types of configurations of robots. Um, some don't even really look like robots, but you get a good variety, a good mix of experiences. All right, so in COVID times, engineering has become even more important. Engineers and technicians at Boeing were able to help by printing over 40,000 face masks for FEMA. So that was an interesting additive manufacturing application. Transition to virtual leadership has been challenging. Uh, remembering to stay flexible, leaning into change, uh, welcoming, again, opportunities to adapt. So staying the course and you know, you're gonna discover a lot of opportunities um, more than you imagined <laughs> at the beginning of your journey. Sometimes having the numbers, the facts and drawings, et cetera, is not always enough. You know, I have skills and abilities my colleagues don't. I see things differently. I pick up on different problems or see uh, connectivity of issues that they may miss. In 2013, only 11% of engineers in the United States were women. I like to think that the statistics are getting better, uh, but there's definitely still a gap. Uh, therefore, I feel, you know, current women engineers really need to volunteer their time. This is where we can really make a difference. Uh, spending one-on-one -on -one time with aspiring engineers, showing them how, explaining the basics, working side by side to solve problems and learn a new technology. Uh, again, uh, back to my first experience, I remembered when we switched control systems in FTC, we went to an Android uh, based platform using cell phones as a control system for these small uh, 18 inch cubed robots. 
this was a good example of reverse mentoring because as things were changing, the students were picking up on it pretty quick and they helped uh, the mentors learn quite a bit. They showed us what they were doing. It was a good opportunity for dialogue and, and mentoring in both directions. So engineering can be hard. We don't always get appreciated. Sometimes we are expected to clean up both literally and figuratively. <laughs> Sometimes we want to help solve problems and some que uh, question our abilities to do so. It's, it's like training your muscles. Resistance can help you grow stronger. All I can say is hang in there, try not to take it personally. We all pay our dues in some way. Serving and helping others can build relationships and trust. So being patient, volunteering, uh, taking advantage of the opportunity uh, to learn. There's always something new to learn. Again, don't ignore communication skills. You know, don't be afraid to reach out to a stranger that's been identified as a technical expert. Within Boeing, we have a nice tool called Insight where we can reach out, um, do a skills-based search and find technical fellowship vocals that can help solve the tough problems. And then reaching out will help build your network and relationships and build lifelong friendships. All right, and then work-life balance. So remembering what's going on at home. Um, it's a time for rapid change. Our days go by very quickly. You got to stay engaged, involved, you know, pull for information constantly. Our desire to learn is what keeps me going. And then working with my son, helping him learn about uh, STEM, get involved in different projects, helping him, you know, figure things out and figure out what he wants to be when he grows up has been an a impactful part of my journey. So thank you again for this opportunity. Oh, sorry for that little box. Oh, it went away. All right, impactful part of my journey. Uh, thank you for the opportunity today to share a little bit about my engineering journey. All right. Well, Nicole, Smart Manufacturing and AMT most certainly appreciate you. Thank you so much. And we all know that variety is the spice of life. So we were able to hear about things, including mechanical ornaments, uh, robotics for laundry. I'm very interested in that. Uh, but then of course, the more uh, germane things, patent application process, the goal supervisory control, if I got that right, goal-based yep. supervisory goal control. Supervising. Yep. Right. Composite fabrication automation, sounds amazing. Vision system <laughs> programming, all the things that we cover in smart manufacturing with regularity. And thanks so much for that. Uh, now, Marie Christine, we're going to shift to you as you can. Please take control of the screen and welcome very much. Thank you very much for being here. Well, thank you for having me. Can you see my screen well? Yes. Mm -hmm. All right. So uh, very honored to be here today. And I uh, and, uh, wanted to take the opportunity to really show many ways to get to make a difference in automation and robotics. And as you can see, as you will hear, my, my path is quite difficult, different from Nicole. So there's definitely more than one ways to get there. <clears throat> so a little bit of my, of, of my path or my, my career uh, movements along the years. So I'm a mechanical engineer by, by, uh, by school. So I, uh, I went to UMass Amherst in the US. Uh, I was a tennis player and uh, reached out to many of the universities in the US that were offering a tennis uh, program and told them, hey, I'm, I live in Quebec, I play tennis and I wanna study engineering. Can I play for your school? And uh, at the end, <laughs> I've sent 50 different letters across the US to try to find a program that would accept me, uh, that would offer me a scholarship to, to join the team. And I, I, find one, I found one in, in Amherst, Massachusetts. So I was really happy to, to take the challenge. So that was one of my first key challenge in my life is to jump into a new, new country, new culture, uh, a new program with a, a university and um, try to learn engineering. So really uh, got me to, to believe in myself in the fact that even if you don't know what's, what to expect, you can still have fun and succeed. So uh, really grew my, my, my resilience skills <laughs> and adaptation skills and, uh, and, and, and open my mind to others and really get to know and really understand where to, uh, uh, where, where, how I can be successful and how I fit in a team. And that really stood with me along my career. Um, so I, after school, I came back to Canada and uh, joined the uh, IBM team uh, here uh, locally. And we were manufacturing uh, 
microelectronics, so really packaging it. So of course, who's, when you speak microelectronics, you speak automation because everything is so small and so rapid that everything is automated. So that was my first introduction to uh, true automation and really uh, got to got to love the, the, the link between technology, logistics and quality, right? So really how can you make the best product in the most efficient way and have the mixed model that just comes to play together and really uh, 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 enhance and, and improve the manufacturing line. So uh, these experiences were really hands-on as I was a, 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 a assist, I was the mechanical engineer in charge of some of the, uh, of the, of the equipment that was there and we trying to make it in, to improve it and, and, and to work on it and join the logistics piece of it. So I was been so climbed the ladder in IBM for quite a bit. I stayed there for a total of 13 years, and and then um, joined um, joined the man ma management team. So really went from a technical person to more of a people leadership uh, team, but really always very linked to technology. So going from doing the technology to inspiring a team to use the technology and take the right choices, and and really grow my strategic thinking, trying to make sure that we were getting the right, uh, all the right steps in front of us for the team to really be successful. Um, and then after 13 years, joined the GE Aviation Company. So uh, a different world, uh, going from the super precise mini, mini uh, microelectronics team to uh, super robust, but at the same time, very complex uh, aviation world. And GE Aviation in Bromont actually uh, manufactures blades and veins for the compressor piece of the engine. So uh, we work on different pieces of, uh, of, of so we, ha we have uh, all kinds of, of engines that actually go on Boeing. So one of the, the main uh, 737 uh, MAX is equipped with a GE engine. Uh, that's called the LEAP. So that's one of the latest technologies in efficiency, but also one of the most challenging that the team has had to build. So really driving the team to develop the right tools, making sure we were getting the right, uh, the right quality of parts. And, but not too long after I joined GE, um, there was an opening in the Automation and Robotics R&D Center. And I jumped onto that opportunity. I was, uh, from my background in IBM, I was really involved in inspection systems and automated systems. And I was missing that a little bit, right? As an engineer and as a, a team leader, you it's it's nice to have the, the mix of technology and leadership. That's what, that's what re really uh, resonated with me. Uh, and, and this team is, is quite special. Um, the, this team was born in Bromont and was in grew to become the, the reference in automation and robotics for the entire supply chain of GE. So GE Aviation has, 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 has plans in over uh, in more than 20 countries in the world. So it goes from Singapore to Selma, Brazil, to uh, Europe. And in Asia, but also in the US, uh, of course. And this small team in Bromont is the center of excellence for all the automation and robotics going into the manufacturing processes. So it is a very broad upper, uh, level of opportunities that we're trying to grasp there to really help the sites go from a, a very manual process, even if it's a very complex and very high technology in its engineering, the fabrication process going into making the engines is quite manual and quite low tech uh, in, in the processes themselves. So really going from having artists really knowing what the particularities of each of the pieces are to automating it, making more, making it more robust, making it more, making it faster to get to an and if, to, to try to, to climb those levels of maturity of technology and automation in inclusiveness that they would eventually be closer to a automotive-like uh, process. Of course, it's a different business model, different mix, different complexities, but at the end, you're trying to make better parts faster, for and more cost effectively in a safe manner. So it's the same targets, different technologies, different environments, but same targets that you're, you're going for. Um, so 
our team is is located in Roman, as I mentioned, and we have delivered in over uh, 20 countries. So basically, uh, the presence of our team is it can be felt in in over 60 of the 80 sites that brought GE Aviation has. So a very a big piece of, of the uh, of the importance of this team and and the pride that we take in what we do is we are able to in, to get involved in in the in entire breadth of manufacturing of of, of aircraft engines. Um, and a little bit like Nicole was mentioning, uh, working for a big company also up, also brings a lot of opportunities. And I was lucky to uh, be part of an engine development program in Prague, Czech, in the Czech Republic. So my family, myself, and my family you see down there is uh, composed of uh, of my uh, my partner and three beautiful girls. So really. Uh, really looking to have them know the world and 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 experience things and we so we all moved to Prague for for nine months and uh, we got to visit Europe we got to know about uh, different cultures again and and really for me the the technical experience that I gained there I was not an automation and robotics expert there I was a project manager there so I really felt uh, um, I really went back to to being inside the project and really be open-minded on culture and how they see things and how they understand their manufacturing processes. Because I had a lot of answers, but they weren't fitting necessarily with the way they were seeing things. So that's really a learning experience that you need to do along your career is how do I adjust what I know and what I would like to push versus what they feel and what where they're coming from. So that's, that's the partnership that you need to develop in all things you do to, to make sure that the team is successful. You're never gonna be successful if you're alone. You need to get the people uh, to work in teams and, and complement each other in order to reach the goal. So that was a very tough, but at the same time, so rewarding experience for myself as an engineer, myself as a leader, my family as, as, as a, as, a, as an experience. So the entire family needed to be very, very resilient the entire time. You go into a new, a, new, a new culture, you don't speak the language, the people there don't speak that much English, the kids only speak French. So it's like, how are we gonna get around there, right? How, and um, so I remember uh, just a, one, one anecdote. It's uh, December 28th and we're, we're all flying on December 29th and we're packing our stuff to go for nine months. And my, my second daughter says, but mom, how is it gonna be? And I like, I don't know, I don't know. You don't know, but I know that we have each other, right? And we will make this work and we will figure it out. And you can rely on me and I'll rely on you. And, and, and it was, so it was really, um, a, a, a team a team effort to go there and and make the most out of it and the kids today still this still talk about it all the time and they are you grow from this right and, and that's you grow from every single step of your work experience and your life experience and make the most out of it and take the small nuggets and put them together into what you want to become and how you want to be and and Really, for me, uh, this automation journey is really a, an example of that because you go from understanding the customer side of being a user of technology to now becoming a team lead creating the technology. So you don't do it for yourself; you do it for your end users. So you make sure that you understand what they what they need and and that and that you put together the right technology for it to 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 give value. So a little bit of that. Maybe, um, so what is this team? The automation team in Bromont, right? What beast is that? So basically we are a team of 30 people, um, researchers, engineers, technicians, so all levels of, 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 uh, of learnings and experiences. And we have a very strong network around us in the, in the Montreal area. The Montreal area is actually one of the main hub of aerospace where you have Pratt & Whitney, you have G Aviation, you have CAE who does, um, who does um, uh, simulators and you have Doughty that makes uh, landing gear. So within an hour, uh, within a hundred kilometers, you can piece together an entire airplane with its engine, its controls and everything else. So uh, very, very vivid 
uh, aerospace area. So lots of uh, great suppliers to become your partners to for technology. And what our team does is really we we provide solutions. So we understand how the site is every single supply chain site is working, what are their constraints and and in people and technology and skills and quality and capacity and capability, whatever the manufacturing process constraints are and try to solve it a uh, piece of them with technology. So we do, uh, we, we pretty much create systems from scratch. So we will invent the industrial solution for a, a certain uh, issue that a site is or a process is living. Um, we, so we, we will uh, design it, uh, program it, uh, build it, deliver it, install it, support it, and then hand in hand with this local sites, we will uh, make it uh, more mature and, and drive. So we try to have an overview, but as a, as a, as a, a, an aircraft engine has many different sections and each of the sections have different parts and different processes. So a solution for one P, one site is not necessarily gonna work for another one. But the big, the, the the nice thing about GE Aviation is that it's got the new make piece, which is actually really making the part uh, for a brand new engine, and then you have the repair or the services side, where engines are taking off the airplanes, put put a, uh, all in different pieces, and you repair each and every one of the parts. So basically, with each world has their own constraints, but then technology can most likely be used in various. Of these, so oftentimes our team is acting as a as a liaison as a, as a as a linking agent between understanding is an issue and repair, solving it, turning around, saying, "Hey, new make, you have that same exact uh, same exact constraints, right? Right. Well, we just developed it. So basically, GE that way is maximizing the output of of the R and D it does and and the technology it develops, make sure that it's spreading." across the, the entire business as much as we can. So what is our mission and vision, right? We are not an integrator because there's many great integrators out there doing pick and place, doing uh, off the shelf automation. So really when you do it yourself, you gotta ask yourself, why should GE do automation and robotics? Why can't they just buy it from the next, from someone? Well, because sometimes what GE needs is off the chart with what the market can offer and, and strong from our understanding of the processes themselves and our technical skill set, we can come in and solve that gap. So we are trying to keep GE as a com on the competitive uh, far front to, to create the best parts for the best, the safest way with the best cost. And how, how we do this is really through you might, some of you might know GRC, which is Global Research Center, located in Niskayuna, New York, which is pretty much the University of GE. So all the GE businesses come together, and all the science and all the the very deep and 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 uh, development in knowledge is made there. So very very inspiring, very smart. Uh, uh, people are there and they're going to develop a nugget or a, a, a module of, of a system, but it's not the system. It's just, hey, an algorithm. It's just a, a, a new camera, a new this, but it by itself cannot produce the outcome. But then it, it, we can, us as technologists, grasp these new pieces, put them together in an industrial system and then have this rolled out on the floor. So that's how our team is working and our team is creating value. So, so we're developing new nuggets with GRC. We're introducing it in the first of a kind system. So trying it out on one site, one shop. And eventually once that well developed, that's when we come in and deliver the full network value. This is when we say, okay, this solution works here, 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 here. And then we, we work with the leadership to make sure that we are, uh, we are spreading the, the good news with it. And of course, the one piece that, that, that we all need to be very aware of is you're never gonna have success if you don't have connection with the reality. Technology is great in a lab, great with technologists around it, but 
understand that you're not going to have a PhD running the parts. It's going to be an operator, a technician, someone that has very good knowledge of the pieces themselves, but not necessarily the technology you're providing them. So that's a critical piece of the puzzle is to really make sure you have connection, you're, you're teaching, you're sharing, you're including them in the, in the technology you are delivering. A little bit of an example of what, uh, what this can come to life like and so our our team is providing uh, standalone systems that uh, that pretty much are machines right so it's uh, and, and and in this case this is an automated solution we have two small robots so working together um, it has eight hours autonomy it can it's actually inserting seals so seals are like razor blades that you need to put in in small areas and there's about and in a two inch by two inch piece, you might have 40 of them to insert with tweezers today. And it was a very, very tedious piece, tedious work for the operators to do and it was taking them forever. So how do you automate this? Because it's, it's easy, it's an easy task, just pick and place it, but to position it to, to have two in the same, in the same slot to make sure you have them all. I mean, there's a lot of, of, of things that your brain does that are quite difficult to, to put into a system. So that's what our team needed to develop. And that's where we see that green gap that I was explaining. Nothing like this ever, ever exists on the market. So how do we put together our, our brains and technology to, to come up with the right solution? Then perception, right? So uh, automation robotics is not only robots, it's everything around it. And Nicole touched on this a lot with the perception uh, piece of the basically the eyes of your system. How do you see it? How do you localize it? How you know where you're at in 3D space and how you uh, reliably perform the task every time. So within that one cell, there's five different cameras, each of them having a, a specific application of what they're do, trying to do. And they all need to work together and send each other information to make sure that the robot is executing right. Um, machine learning, Nicole also touched on that a little bit. So basically here, you don't have an exact picture of what a good part looks like. It, you need the system to know that this is a good part. So it, it is recognizing from, from tons of images it's gathering that, oh, I can accept this seal to be a little bit off. It's still good. If you were to say good or no good without the AI, it would say, well, it's different, so it's no good. And then you say, oh, score it at whatever percent, and then it's going to be good enough. But the AI brings you that extra capacity to say, I don't need to be black and white. I can be gray, and I can still understand what uh, the, the, imp the potential impact on my part. So a lot more autonomy by taking the right decisions at the right place. And then how you have this all talk together, right? How can you make sure that you have an easy interface for, there's a lot of science into this, there's a lot of R&D into this, there's a lot of unknowns at first, but then when you, when you hit play, it needs to be simple. It needs to be reliable, simple, legit logic, and, and a black box for the operator, right? In the sense, you don't want him to, to think, oh, my sensor must be tricked or whatever. It needs to be super robust so that you get the value out of that huge investment that your that GE made. So, so how do you simplify the life of the operator? How do you simplify the life of the technician that will need to troubleshoot if something happens? How do you make sure that you have redundancy in your in your logic so that you don't stop for every single time you have a hiccup? Uh, how do you make sure that when you have a mode of lights out mode, which means that it's unattended, that it's not going to stop when it sees someone something happen? It's going to actually have a, a way, a loop to say, oh, when this happens, these are my options that I can take. And when I'm in this mode, I take this option. When I'm in this mode, I take this option. So a lot of, a lot of thinking behind how will the system think and how can I reliably code it uh, to, to make it robust. So a lot of the, the so as you, as you can see in my presentation, I'm not the one doing the programming here. I'm inspiring my team and putting together the best team to execute this, but making sure that, but uh, so all of the technologies that Nicole talked about, we have specialists in each field of them, but myself, I'm 
I'm the spe um, 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 I'm the the rep the representative or really what what we should be doing, but the how we do it is 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 the team's uh, expertise. So what I do though, what do I do as as how do I bring automation to the next level myself as as, as uh, in my role? <clears throat> Basically, I need to understand the constraints, understands the environment and propose the right evolution for each site. Um, you, we, by understanding the technology, understanding its constraints, its capacity, its, its robustness or weakness, that's how I put, that's, that's my, my engineering background really allows me to have a critical mindset on what combination could be good for this problem or this site. So I guide the team to say, this site is good with robots or has no robots on their floor. So you cannot bring someone something with AI on it because it's just gonna, as soon as it fails, it's gonna die there. So, okay, so we go from deploy the basics, right? Uh, uh, making sure that you are grasping the maturity level for each of the sites to make sure that you are bringing the right technology for the right folks at the right time. So, so technology delivers value for your customers. Um, and then, and once they are more, more, uh, and this is a very simple system, just a table with a camera and, and an HMI, and, but it is giving valuable data they can, they can now see the value in that data. I was like, oh, nice. Now can I have it actually move itself? Yes, we can. And, you know, slowly but surely making that maturity level level evolve and going to the, to the right, at the right pace for them. Uh, this is more, so our team is very involved in, in some of the automation of the inspection side or of the, uh, of the digital side. So, because as these pieces are so critical, there's a lot of inspection stations that need to happen. And, and so it's quite, it is one of the most uh, important challenge that we need to face is to be able to see uh, potential defects and various conditions, various uh, approaches. So a lot of, a lot of development there. Uh, and on the automation piece as well, right? Go from one robot to one robot multiple to a line to potentially an, an, an autonomous system. So you need to know what this could look like at the end. So you backtrack it and walk the, the sites to it. So basically my role is a lot more on the strategic side, on the mac, matching my technology understanding with my ability to be a strategic thinker to really make sure that what is selected as technology makes sense and in time is, is brought to the right, uh, the right folks. So that's in a nutshell, a little bit about me and how I, uh, I impact. And again, thank you to SME for doing that, uh, that publication. I think it's important that we show there's many, many different ways to have impact as a woman. You can still be a mother and, and love that piece, but still be really uh, uh, driven by technology and using your human skills to, to drive teams to, to make a difference. Excellent. So first, uh, merci beaucoup de parler anglais. <laughs> really appreciate that. Thank you. And uh, it's so impressive to hear your story. Uh, we're thankful to the whole of tennis for uh, leading us to your impressive career and leading us to this program today. So we were able to hear from uh, Christine about uh, resilience and adaptation skills, about AI and machine learning, the value of that, which we write about all the time in smart manufacturing. I really think it's impressive how you managed to deliver a study abroad program in Prague for your entire family. <laughs> and uh, you made it, you know, brought it back to what it means for work and your business, how you adjust to, sorry, how you adjust what you know to the situation at hand. And that kind of flexibility is always going to be good. And we learned about the automation journey um, and, 
you very capably explained how robotics can address tedium. That's a, that's a big deal. So that really leads us to our first question, which is uh, how often is it the case, Marie Christine, that uh, GE Aviation finds that it needs to develop its own automation tech? That's a good question. It's fairly often actually, um, because the high mix, low volume aspect of this business mm -hmm. is often preventing from regular automation and robotics to be beneficial. Uh, so our team really needs to, so, and, and one of the key elements of automation and robot, robotics that is difficult right now to achieve and, and costly to achieve is that super flexibility. And I'm sure Nicole, <laughs> you have mm -hmm. the same issues with, with changing, uh, changing models and changing technology. So yep. oftentimes for us to really find a niche for a, a beneficial project to happen, that project needs to be super flexible. And that's where you need this extra uh, intelligence in the systems. And so quite often actually a project would need a little bit of us to make sure that it meets the, uh, the targets. Mm -hmm. Nicole, can you answer that question as well? Yes, definitely. Um, we have very similar concerns. We have a lot of low rate projects and then we need the adaptability, the flexibility that's not there uh, with a system that off the shelf would be designed to sit, do the same repetitive task over and over because uh, as we showed earlier with the goal oriented control system, sometimes we might not have a particular tool in place or we might, you know, we have to change the way that the program would function uh, even from aircraft to aircraft or iteration to iteration. There is a lot of adapting and changing uh, that I spoke to the vision system piece. Uh, aircraft are not assembled the same way every time. Uh, there's a lot of assembly variation. So we have to, to make a system, a robotic system that can adapt to its environment. So mm -hmm. go out and scan where the edges of the parts are actually located mm -hmm. and then move those uh, locations where you're gonna drill the hole in accordance with where the parts actually located, not just drilling in the same you know, nominal space every time. Mm -hmm. Uh, another question for both of you. What has been your uh, greatest challenge in robotics and automation? Nicole, you want to go first on that? Sure. Uh, I think for me, the greatest challenge, again, is getting all the stakeholders on the same page, getting all the people in a room early enough in the process, and then really setting that vision, right? Especially as managers, you know, it's, it's part of our responsibility to help set the vision. What is this work so going to do? What is the end uh, product? What defines success? Uh, that's where we play a huge role. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And how yeah. about you, Marie Christine? Yeah, I would say that definitely, exactly like Nicole said, but also for, for the aviation, for GE Aviation, one of the key challenge was to get the stakeholders to understand the value of automation. Because oftentimes they were, okay, I need more capacity. I just shoot an extra body to it. Why would <laughs> I automate this? And, and, that's and having them understand that it, this is going to allow you to still keep the person right so people were like it's going to take our jobs no it won't mm -hmm. it will secure your job because you will do more parts more accurately and, and we will still use your brain to figure out if the parts good or no good but you can overlook a series of systems and we use your brain not your muscles right so for you it, it's a value added Peace because you bring intelligence to the system, not bring motion, right? So, so the challenge was really to get that philosophy introduced in and in, across the world because, uh, and, and the, the 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 business challenge being what it is, making sure that you get you you get financial benefits on top of human benefits and agreeing to it. Yeah, I think it's amazing that we're still still having this debate to some degree about uh, job killing versus job creating. It's so obvious that it's on the other side, you know, creating. Mm -hmm. Nicole, you were going to say something? Yes, another part of that benefit is the ergonomic benefits too. Because yeah. I know in particular for the C-17 program, there were a number of repetitive stress injuries, um, you know, doing a lot of riveting. And the automation really helped solve a lot of those problems. Um, so yes, the, the humans retain their jobs, they're running the systems, we make the interface easy 
that they can interact with and and um, take a lot of the human factors components into the, the HMI design. But then they're not out there holding a rivet gun for eight hours a day and and getting uh, you know three or four elbow surgeries. <laughs> yeah, no one needs that, right? Yeah. Right, right. So it, automation brings a lot to the table when it comes to human factors components. Uh -huh. Um, for each of you, let's start with Mary Christine. What were your best, or what was your best one practical experience you would point to so far? I think it's um, it's the, the the one picture I was showing in my in my. It's really this this job of inserting seals had been tried many times in the past, but having the business believe that my team could do it. And we did it, and it's it's super success. It's one of the most rewarding challenge that the team has, has handled and overcome, and um, so it's it's a success for the team. It, so that's what I'm so proud of. It's that team success. So that's definitely one of the toughest challenge we needed to overcome, and uh, really uh, because of the complexity of the positioning, complexity of the variety of items to handle the precision that was needed, the speed it was needed to be going at, all of these combines were going one against, against, against the other, right? So it was all bad guys, but finally we solved it. So it's just quite, quite, quite uh, challenging and, and, and rewarding. That does sound amazing. And can you remember roughly from start to finish how long that took? Yeah, it actually took, um, it took a year of R&D and about six months of, um, of, building the actual system after that. So mm -hmm. it took a year and a half, uh, quite a bit of money involved into it. But then we also found out that one of our partners slash competitor, because it's a very uh, intricate um, market, um, was trying the same thing. And it took them two and a half years, more money, and they didn't get to the results we were at. So we're like tapping the back that way. <laughs> it, was, uh, it was good to, to, to have the chance to see comparison and then understand that we 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 solved it yeah mm -hmm. fantastic how about you nicole your best practical experience so far yeah so one of the most effective projects that i worked on was really one of the, the simplest uh was we do a lot of toolbox shadowing at boeing both for uh, fog control so for an object debris control to make sure all the tools get put back in the box at the end of the day and everything's accounted for uh, when we started that project uh the um technician was actually taking a piece of foam you know laying the tools out using a sharpie to draw around every shape and then taking a dremel and just hand carving that foam out so what we did was we set up an automated system a mobile cart where you could just lay out your toolbox and that was one uh, we had to figure out a lot of vision system challenges right with some pool, tools are particularly shiny there's a lot of you know custom uh, adjustments that people have done to their tools. They've taped this or that or the other. That's why we couldn't use a, you know, kind of off the shelf system. But so we actually took a picture of the tools that would go in the toolbox, translated that into a binary image, translated that into a DXF file, sent that to a laser cutter. It would just cut, laser cut the foam. And then we could do contrasting colors. So we'd have like a blue on top and a bright yellow underneath. So we, we got that visible queuing for the toolboxes as well. And, and it was really pretty simple project went together very quickly, but saved our, our operators were able to go from um, maybe creating eight or 10 drawers a day to being able to complete multiple full toolboxes in a day. It was, it was a really mm -hmm. dramatic throughput increase for the team. So mm -hmm. yeah, it's the, the impact on people. That's the most rewarding. I would mm -hmm. say with it's how we, how we really change the people's lives with the technology. So we're, yeah. That's, that's where the reward is, I feel. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, another question for each of you. <clears throat> what would you say is the most unexpected lesson that you have learned along the way? You want to go first, Marie Christine? Uh, unexpected lesson was don't assume that everybody is super engaged with technology. <laughs> uh, <that's funny. laughs> you know, it's like, how can they not love this, right? It's uh, so that for me was uh, so now we understand where they come from and why, and that's an uh, unexpected lesson for sure. Very interesting. And Nicole, yeah, I definitely agree with that. I think the people side of it for me um, has been uh, the most unexpected portion again, yeah, understanding what 
what technology limitations are. Um, not everyone speaks the same language. A lot of times in an automation project, I mean, even, you know, aside from the fact that we have international teams, but uh, certain terms, especially at Boeing, uh, mean certain things and they may not mean that um, outside for the rest of the world. <laughs> so really mm -hmm. learning how to communicate, how to talk to each other, how to reach that common ground where you're, you're having effective communication. I think that's been the most unexpected mm -hmm. part of my journey. So let's get to the uh, female aspect of this because it is so important um, to encourage more girls to think about this and women to become engineers. What would you suggest, Nicole, first for women who want to get into the field specifically for women? So I think uh, thinking about, you know, what, what connects you, what, what drives you, what particular, whether it be a particular technology or a particular skill set, a uh, particular group of folks, you know, if you love education, like I said, you know, get involved in, like first, I'm mentoring everybody. Some of the most effective mentors and coaches have not been engineers. They've been uh, preschool teachers or you know, someone that was working in business and it gets you exposed to robotics and automation, but mm -hmm. it's not as threatening, right? It's a, it's a less threatening environment. And then continuing education. I'm a huge proponent to, for continuing education. So go back, take one class, take a couple of classes. I just dip your toe in the water and see what interests you and what really drives you. Because I think if you're passionate about your work, uh, you'll never work a day in your life, right? <laughs> so <laughs> you'd be excited to get in there and, and do that problem solving. And it doesn't have to be, you know, a four year plus program. You know, you can take smaller steps and really find where your niche is in the technology space. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Uh, Marie Karen, uh, sorry, Marie Christine. Yes. Um, well, Go with your heart, right? You like math, don't worry, go. And then it, it, that profession is evolving and is there's so many branches you can take. If And so don't be afraid to try it. And frankly, uh, from my experience over the last 20 years, uh, I've been in almost all men teams, but the men in there are really open-minded. Like I lead a team right now of 30 and there's two girls myself and one more engineer so and it but we don't see the difference so really don't put a glass ceiling where there isn't right trust yourself be yourself and 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 do what you love and there's so many options um and again don't be afraid to talk about technology with young girls right uh, i i have i was in a seminar one time with the with the uh a presenter from the NASA, and he was saying, which is scary and interesting, he was saying, in order, they have, they had done some studies to see what actually gets women to want to be engineers. Uh -huh. And he's like, you know what it is? It's oftentimes that one conversation when the, when the little girl is in second grade, and mm -hmm. she does something, and then you say, you know what, you like this, you feel good about what you just did? Yes, yes. You know that it's electrical engineers that do this for a living? <laughs> and that just lights a spark, right? So yeah. they, so they kind of, they, they're not. Girls oftentimes are not building engines or, you know, playing to create. That when they play Legos, they make village. They mm -hmm. make, you know, they don't make a, a plane or. So, that is, uh, you know, you can you can always relate to some sort of engineering to to have them see the relationship. So that's uh, that's important and and um. Having models like Nicole, like myself, like uh, any of the 20 women that were that were portrayed, uh, there's many different personalities. Um, so being an engineer is just not one mold, right? There's a lot to it. So try it. <laughs> Very good. So thank you both so much. I have no doubt that you have provided a spark here as you discussed um, how important that is to um, bring the world of engineering to young minds and especially young girls' minds and um, people of all stripes. So I appreciate your time, Nicole. Thank you very much. Thank you. I really and enjoyed Mary it. Chris, sorry, Mary, thank you. And Mary Christine, thank you very much as well. Thank you very, very much. Have a wonderful day. Thank you.